Everybody uh, got your snowshoes in the snowshoe rack held by the doors? Good, good. No snowshoes in the sanctuary, but snowy shoes, well, yeah, that's okay. Such a good, good to see you all here this morning. And for those who didn't make it out through the snow, I, I also celebrate that they um, chose to, you know, follow their own comfort level. Um, and it is uh, always a blessing to gather in the house of the Lord. It's always a blessing to see each and every one of you. And it's always a blessing to know that wherever two or more are gathered, he is here. He is with us. And so let us uh, prepare our hearts to uh, celebrate the presence of the Lord this morning. Do we have any announcements? Joy. Just a celebration here, my brother back in congregation for a while. Amen. There's a, a car going around for two young men. I was thinking about it and I thought maybe I'd uh, hit them in the yellow car and get right next to the church. I'm sure it would, yes. Thank you for that. Any other announcements? If there's anyone here, and I know there is, um, planning on going to the Louisiana trip, I uh, just want to ask a question after worship, like during fellowship, so uh, be sure to find me and uh, uh, I'll ask the question. Um, any other announcements? Okay, if not, then let us uh, take a moment to open our worship with prayer. Heavenly Father, as we gather here on this snowy morning, we thank you for your light and your warmth. We thank you for all of your gifts. We thank you for the way that you lead us and ask that your spirit be upon us in this hour of worship and all throughout our lives to empower us to follow where you lead, to hear your call in our lives so that the good news might be shared so that people might come into relationship with you through your Son, and so that we all might be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Bless our worship this morning. Inspire us, lead us, and fill our hearts with love and joy in your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our uh, opening hymn is going to be Where Charity and Love Prevail. Uh, it's four verses only, one, two, five, and six. Elaine couldn't make it this morning, so um, this will be a, a video with the, uh, I mean, uh, the music will be playing with the words uh, from the PowerPoint. And just to give you a heads up, um, the final hymn I wasn't able to get uh, completely fixed before worship started. So for that one, we're going to need to use our hymnals, um, and I'll announce that at that point too. But uh, there will be music, but no words. Okay. Where charity and love prevail. It's been a stressful morning so far. Um, 
as we prepare to give our offerings and as the ushers come forward to receive them, let us also prepare our hearts to give them to our Lord as an offering. Let us prepare to resolve to follow where God leads and to let charity and love prevail through all that we do. And if somebody would like to hum a little music while the offering is going, um, So in the future, I'm going to actually prepare the music both ways and try to have a little uh, music that can be played um, for those times when it's snowy and Elaine can't make it. Not blaming Elaine at all, just uh, blaming myself for not having foreseen every circumstance. Um, so instead of somebody humming, I guess I just talked throughout the entire offering. Um, so let us rise and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you have given us. Thank you for your presence in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, that you have received us as your own. So as we give back to you, we pray, Lord, that you will receive these gifts and send them into the world to do your work and your will. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now we will share with one another our hearts, the things that are weighing them down, as well as the things that lift them up, those things that make us cry, and those things that make us sing with joy. As the people of God, we are brothers and sisters. So let us share with our brothers and sisters our very hearts. Anybody have anything? Jeff, yeah. don't be shy. Oh, I, um, I want to thank everybody for the prayers, the cards, the phone calls. Um, it's great to be this morning. I really do feel the support. Um, thank Joy for doing the laundry, getting the groceries on and on and on. Um, it's funny how we have a plan in your mind how it's going to go. You think you're in charge, but then you get the reality that it's hard I'm not in charge. It's hard I'm not doing this. So when we when you get that revelation again, I don't know how many times you have to get it, but it takes a lot. Then everything seems to smooth out. And there's one other thing, my daughter-in-law Jen had to she's having brain surgery Tuesday at the University of Chicago. She's had a lot of different illnesses, so we're trying to figure out what it is. Um, there's some kind of malformation in the spinal fluid. We went to one through brain right or something. She's having that done Tuesday, so she needs prayers too. We will definitely pray for, for Jen for that. Um, so that's on Tuesday. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Maxine. Tom Hart's son, Darren, would like prayers for Bob Roger Rado. He had a shop accident yesterday, and he's in university. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, prayers for Roger Lapp. Uh, Brenda. Prayers for Amy. She's having some diagnostic surgery on Thursday. Prayers for Amy having diagnostic surgery. And John? I would ask for prayers for a uh, family of one of my cousins, Sherry Grimm. Uh, she passed away a week ago from the court case. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? First. I'm just blessed to have the neighbors I have that come over with snow blowers and snow shovels. And yes, I I confess I was on my way out of town and saw you out there shoveling and um, knew I should have stopped, so I apologize that I didn't, but... I love um, doing that, so... No. Well... <laughs> but I have two great neighbors. Well, at least one. 
At least one. Yes. <laughs> I won't say which. No, you have great neighbors. Um, anyone else? I would like prayers for uh, the family of my mom's sister, Lavelle Andrews. Um, she passed away from dementia this week. Um, and the family, yeah, Heather's like, wow. Um, the family's kind of reeling because Aunt Lavelle had sort of moderate dementia and then just the last few weeks had a rapid uh, decline in mental function and uh, passed away. So, but I would also like to give thanks for um, my extended family. Uh, we now sort of have a cousin's text group. And while it's slightly intrusive, um, the day that uh, LaBelle passed away, I think I got about, I don't know, 50 or more texts of people expressing their, their prayers and concerns. So it, it was, uh, every time I turned around, I'm picking up my phone. But it was such a, a gracious act of love. So I'm grateful for uh, my extended family. Um, anyone else? Ah, Rita. I just have an announcement. That we have a funeral dinner on Tuesday at 3 for um, Charles. Charles Galbraith. Galbraith. Right. You. And, um, and it's just pie and coffee. Mm -hmm. was their request. And thank you for reminding me. I meant that to be in my uh, prayer concerns and just spaced it out. But yes, Charles passed away uh, earlier this week. Um, he was at uh, uh, Nursing Home Care Center in South Bend. Uh, the funeral will be Tuesday, and as Rita said, uh, it will not, won't be a full luncheon, it'll just be pie and coffee. And the reason it's pie and coffee is Charles uh, told his son Johnny that um, he loved pie and coffee after worship. So Johnny thought it'd be a great way to honor his father's memory with we all do something that he, he loved. Um, Bill. Uh, I heard that uh, there was a 10 year old boy that was killed on 421 yesterday, uh, possibly a golf south of our thought area. So I, I don't know why particulars, but just pray for the family. Yes, absolutely. A um, 10 year old boy killed on 421. So that's it's always tragic when so young dies like that. It's, Anyone else? Okay, let us take all of these concerns and expressions of gratitude and joy to our Lord in prayer. Good, loving, healing, comforting God. As we pray to you this morning, we bring all of our lives to you all of the things that we have experienced, the ups and the downs, the joys and the sorrows, the victories and the setbacks. We acknowledge, Lord, that you are Lord of all of life and that you have ordered this life with your wisdom. You have set us in this world that we might experience your love and your grace, that we might learn to love and care for one another, that we might grow not only in righteousness, but also in mercy. We know, Lord, that you are all merciful, all loving, and that you are always with us if we would only reach out our hand and accept your presence, your ministries to us and the ministries of our community and friends and family who surround us with love, that we might know a little bit of your love. For those who suffer, Lord, we ask today for your healing comfort. For those who sorrow, we pray, Lord, that your light and your presence might reassure them for those who have lost, for those who are broken, we ask, Lord, that you mend us again. 
And for those who are grateful and thankful and celebrating, we give you praise and thanks. For the snow, we give you thanks. Yeah. For the sun, we give you thanks. For all of the things that you give us, we give you thanks. And we pray this morning, Lord, that our thanks may be more than words or a few, but they, they may translate into action that our hearts might grow in urgency to reach out and be your hands and feet in this world, to walk in this world, to bring hope and healing, as your Son, Jesus Christ, walked in this world, healing the broken and giving hope to the hopeless. May we follow in his calling, O Lord. And so we will gather our voices together and pray as one, the way he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now as Carol comes forward to share with us the scripture, let us prepare our minds and hearts to have an encounter with the living word of God through the words of scripture. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, verses 12 through 31a. For just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For it is the one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jew and Greek, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less part of a body. And if the ear will say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the head to the foot. On the contrary, the members of the bodies that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our, but God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior members, that there may be no dissension within the body, that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed to the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess the healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Carol. Please pray with me. Speak to us this morning, Lord. Lead us and empower us to follow your call. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's sermon is really part two of last week's sermon. Last week, we talked about the gifts that God has given us. 
Now today we're going to talk more about what those gifts are for. And in doing so, I, I was, uh, since it was so similar to last week, it was, I kept kind of getting back into saying the same things I said last week. So if I do that, I would apologize, except repetition is good, right? So if I kind of repeat some things from last week, um, we just need to hear it twice. But one thing we didn't hear last week was me singing. And I'm going to start off with a little a verse of a little song. Most of you probably know it. I'm a little white duck sitting in the water. A little white duck doing what I ought to. And I can't remember the rest of it. But the last line of that song by the uh, famous accidental theologian Burl Lives was that in the end, after uh, a green frog came along and jumped off of the lily pad and a bug came along and tickled the frog and then a snake came along and scared the frog and the duck and ate the bug, the poor bug, nobody was doing what they ought to. The pond was empty, so maybe the snake was still there. And it's a really, I loved that song when I was a child, but it's really pretty profound because we all have been given a place, whether it's sitting in the water or sitting on the lily pad, we have our place and it is God given. And when we do what we ought to, we are fulfilling God's intent for us. But when we aren't, the last, very last line of that song is boo hoo hoo. When we fail, fail is not even the right word. When we just simply don't or aren't doing what we ought to, being what we ought to, then our joy is incomplete. And it's not, I'm a little, I want to say, the word ought. The word ought is kind of scolding, isn't it? You ought to be better, especially you. You ought to. You ought to. I ought to. But it's really not so much an ought as it is an opportunity. I'll talk a bit about my own call into the ministry. I entered seminary in 2008, at which point I would have been 47 years old. I first sensed God's call in my life into the ministry when I was probably nine or 10. And my first thoughts about that sense that maybe I'm supposed to be a pastor was who do you think you are? So I just didn't take that serious. But throughout my teenage years, and I got continued to be very involved in the church and in some ways was kind of a leader amongst the youth, I kept thinking about it. When I was 18 years old, I talked to my parents about, you know, maybe this is something I want to do. And my dad said, oh, that's unrealistic. And my mother said, oh, no. Um, being an overly obedient young man, if my parents were against it, well, I'm not going to do it. I went, continued through college, graduated, got busy with life, but all along there was this, I don't want to call it nagging, but almost nagging, that I wasn't quite doing what I ought. So finally, and it actually took my life kind of falling apart when my marriage ended, to reevaluate and say, what am I living for? Am I living hopelessly to make somebody else happy? Am I living to follow the desires of my parents? Or am I living to please God and do what I ought of? 
So, I went to seminary. And whether you think it's a good thing or not, I became a pastor. And there have been a lot of sacrifices to become a pastor. Definitely make a lot less money, incurred a huge amount of debt, and it is, you know, like some work is backbreaking. Often being a pastor is soul breaking. You, you minister with your, your heart. And it's hard work, not complaining. Actually, I'm doing the opposite. I have never been happier in my life, never more fulfilled, never had more joy. And I think that's because I'm doing what I ought. So I want each and every one of you to go to seminary. <laughs> no, no. I don't. But I want you to consider what the gifts that we talked about last week are for. They're for pleasing God, and loving our neighbor, but they're also very specific gifts. Gifts that enable us to do what God calls us to do, to be who God calls us to be. So for some people, that indeed is professional ministry in all of its many forms. For others of us, it may be that they have the gift of healing, and so go into nursing, or medicine, or pharmacy. Some of us may have a different kind of gift of healing, where that when somebody is hurting, just our very presence brings them comfort. I was thinking on the drive-in this morning about the old Gordon Lightfoot song about rainy day people. They always seem to know when you're feeling blue. That's the gift of healing. When somebody just senses, when the Spirit speaks to them and says, Something, somebody's hurting. And people with that kind of gift of healing, when they're doing what they ought, just listening to somebody, just sitting quietly with somebody, just their very presence brings comfort and healing. On the other end of the spectrum, some of us are really good with numbers or systems and make great leaders and administrators. And anybody who's ever had a boss probably has somewhat of a negative feeling toward administrators, but it's an important gift from God to be able to make our institutions, our businesses, our churches function. Some of us, our calling may be to entertain others, to lift people's spirits. Some of us are just fun to be around, and that's a gift from God. And it's a calling from God. Because without those people, I suspect that most of us would take life way too serious and take ourselves way too serious. There are so many gifts and callings I suspect that there's a unique calling for each and every unique individual because it's going to express itself differently, like all the different snowflakes out there on the road. We all have our place, our task, the thing that we ought to not just do, but be. Because it's not about simply fulfilling tasks and doing work and doing ministry. It's about being in sync with that person that God created you and I to be. When our lives line up with God's intention for us, we are doing what we are. And even though there will be <laughs> Challenges, difficult days, disappointments, failures. 
there is still an inherent joy in being on your journey path. The joy of being who God created you to be. And the word be is so important because I don't want you to hear that it's just about what you're supposed to do. My, my preaching professor in seminary started the class off by saying, now preachers, don't give me more stuff to do. I've got enough stuff to do. Give me some good news. But if you're going to give me something to do, give me the power to do. And I'm going to suggest that the power to do the things that we're called to do comes from being who we are. Comes from being in sync with God's intention for us. It comes from being where and who we are. Because we aren't in dissonance with our own selves. We're in perfect harmony with what God has made us to be. We are a very active church, many doers in this church. And I am grateful for that. But I know in my own life, I need to retune, readjust regularly. Because I easily, quickly, start to think that I know what I ought to be. And I get a little bit out of sync. I'm not talking about rampant sin or anything like that. I'm just talking about my agenda and mistaking it for God's. Perhaps that doesn't happen to you, but I suspect it probably does. So how do we be who we are. And it's the thing that we've been talking about for months now. It's through practicing our discipleship. It's through doing the means of grace, living the means of grace. Prayer, Bible study, attendance at worship, receiving the Lord's Supper, reaching out to others in service, all of those things are ways that God works within us to bring us back into harmony with God's intention for us. Now, I know some of that's been difficult since I got sick back in December. And I apologize for that, but I think not having the studies and things has actually helped me to heal, and I'm feeling much better. But come February, our classes will resume. Come February, I invite you, and this is our living the call for this week, I invite you to think of what ways, what practices can you do to bring your own life back into harmony? And how do you know if your life is out of harmony? And I'd say it's, it's simple, but not easy. Is your spirit at peace? Do people around you respond like you've just shown the light of God into their lives? Do you feel mercy towards people who suffer, even those who suffer from being sinful? Or is your heart, your mind, frightened, angry, <laughs> hopeless, frustrated? Not that there's anything wrong with those things per se, but just like when you hear music and it's out of tune, you know something's not right. So I invite you to join with me making a commitment to practice discipleship, 
as part of our rebooting, our reforming, and our doing, part of resetting our lives, and part of answering the call that God has given to each one of us. Because when we are in harmony with God's intention, there is true joy, true peace. I'm sure for many people, just simply being a believer in Christ is all that they want. But they are people that I quite frankly pity because they are denying themselves the full joy of being what and who they are. Amen. Let us now join our voices together and give our thanks to God in prayer. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right to give our thanks. I'm sorry. It is right and good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, you created the heavens and the earth and called them very good. Even when we disobeyed you, when we mistreat ourselves and each other, and when we misuse your creation, you are still faithful and merciful. You have not given up on your creation or on us, but have worked through Israel and the church to restore us to the perfection in which you created us. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, who redeems us and makes possible our return to being your very good creation, to being your blessed children, to being in harmony with you. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and reveal to us the gifts you have given us that we might serve you and our neighbor in the mission of love that you have called us to live. Unite us as one body that our very gifts might work together to restore your kingdom. Fill our hearts with the gift of your love, that we may reflect your loving kindness into this broken world, that your glory may heal it. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now we'll have our last hymn. It's number 338 in the hymnal. And as I said, there will be no words on the screen, so... We'll have to do it the old-fashioned way. And I know this happened one time, and somebody said to me, actually, not to call you out, but I believe it was Karen, that we did, oh, it was a couple of years ago. And you said, you didn't bring your glasses, so you couldn't see the hymn. So I'm glad to see you have your glasses today. <laughs>
But instead, it's amazing. God's grace enables us to hear, to respond, to be that which God calls us to be. God's grace, it forgives us, but it does more than that. It empowers us. It fulfills us. It leads and calls us. Because God's grace is the very power of God's Spirit working in and through us. And that is as a Father. So go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And follow where He leads. Be who He calls you to be. And love as He loved us. Amen. Amen. Amen.